Hi. Hello. Um, I haven't had a chance to show you this, but this is quite amazing. Um, this is a Fisher Price iPad plastic teething rattle case. Okay, and it says on the case, clear film protects your iPad from dribble and drool, free learning apps, right? Um, it does actually show the child using it seated and pressing on it, which is, but could you imagine biting on the iPad? And it says it has an unwanted, it avoids the unwanted pressing of the home button. So <clears throat> I think I paid almost $50 for this. Then you would imagine the cost of the iPad, and even if you don't have it connected to uh, your cellular system, you have to connect it to Wi-Fi, right? It's quite, quite something. So I think it's an example of what we need to work against. I, there were excellent questions I got. Steve, I want you to ask your question. Um, young Steve, right there. OK, Sorry. hold on one second. Sorry. So I was wondering about Bluetooth and earpieces. Could you talk about those? Randy, are you still here? Yeah. yeah. All right. The, as an engineer, for just Bluetooth has um, is almost in the infrared, if I understand it. Really uses about one ten thousandth. I don't know. I don't know. I actually don't know much about Bluetooth. All right, except that it is much much weaker. Okay. However, um, I'll let Lloyd comment about that too. Thank you. No, no, wait, right here. The yes, average, sir. the average power of a uh, cell phone is quite low, and the Bluetooth is about maybe as much as ten times lower. That's part of the question. But people keep them on their ear almost like status symbols, sixteen hours a day. So, if you used a, a cell phone for one point six hours and had the Bluetooth on your ear for sixteen hours, you're getting the same radiation you know, this is the cumulative radiation. Uh, and the question is, where is the cell phone when you have the Bluetooth? Good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was wondering if you kind of like wear it in the same pocket, you know, over the period of a long time, we have, is there any way to kind of like remediate that effect kind of after the fact? Okay. Um, the wonderful thing about the human body is that we have DNA repair. You all have cancerous cells in your body at any time. We know that because studies, uh, autopsies that are done of people who die accidentally at almost any age. At autopsy, you'll find cancerous cells, particularly in men in the prostate, women in the breast, but they haven't become cancer. What does that tell you? It tells you that if you're healthy, you eat your broccoli, you exercise, you do your yoga, you play your music, um, pray in whatever form you're comfortable, that your body will repair damage. And in fact, other studies, which could be a whole other talk, but maybe somebody else here would like to give, would show that there are antioxidants such as diethyl endomethane, which is in broccoli, that repair damage. One of the most interesting things about melatonin, I mentioned to you that melatonin, I showed you that one study about repair. So let's say you used a cell phone for years and it was always in one place and it was always you know, giving you a lot of exposure and you may even have had some dermatological effects because there are sometimes skin reactions. The good news is, particularly you, you're young, you can repair that damage. Sleep in the dark, eat your broccoli and stop worrying. <laughs> I thought that maybe I should write a book with that title, frankly, because the fact is there's no reason to panic about what we have here. I think the situation for cell phones today and um, iPads is kind of like what we had for cars in the 1960s, when there was a huge debate, do we really need airbags? Can we afford it? The Iacocca, I wrote in my, uh, my first book, When Smoke Ran Like Water, he testified before the US Congress that if we required catalytic converters and airbags on cars, it would bankrupt the car industry. Well, it didn't. It actually made it one of the most successful in the world in America because we produced some of the safest cars after Sweden, and we, there was a market for it. 
I think there's a market for safer devices. The phone companies, the designers, the software designers in particular, antenna designers, who get enough to market their safer devices are going to make a fortune. And the world's going to be better off for it. Yeah. So you're going to be fine. And the story of melatonin is like, goes like this. Blind women naturally have twice as much melatonin as sighted women because they are in the dark all the time. And when you're in the dark, your pineal gland produces melatonin. Melatonin repairs damage throughout the body. It's really powerful antioxidant, naturally occurring. Blind women have about half as much breast cancer as sighted women. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So I always travel with a sleep mask. And I do take melatonin from time to time. Uh, only in the evening. And melatonin is now being studied at the National Cancer Institute in clinical trials as a treatment for breast cancer. But in very high doses, by the way, doses that, you know, you wouldn't, you, they're pharmacological doses. What, can, you, can you give a range? Um, between, um, it's between 50 to 200 milligrams. So, you know, and it has to be, I think what they're doing is they're time releasing it so that, because otherwise, I, I don't know, I can't imagine what you'd feel like to take that much. Most people get a reaction from one to three milligrams. Wow. Yes? Microphone? Wait. Can you say if someone has a microphone, please? Mm -hmm. Start over. Uh, if someone has uh, uh, night lights uh, where they can see it from their bed, and they should turn those off? Absolutely. In fact, sleeping in the dark from an evolutionary point of view is a good idea. But um, darkness makes melatonin. Darkness is mu it's a much more restful sleep. Sleep is one of the most important things you can do for health. And um, disconnecting for the half an hour before you go to bed. There are studies that have found there is an increase in insomnia in people who are like always on all the time, like my husband used to be. And um, you know, trying to keep trying to keep your sleeping space for sleeping. Um, it's, it's just a good idea. And trying to, now some people experience sensitivity to these devices, although the science on that phenomenon is really not very rigorous to be charitable. Ha but having said that, there clearly is evidence for a range of sensitivities and responses. There clearly is. Is, is there an ADA record? Can I ask a question first? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, there is a, an effect. A spectral effect. Is the mic off? Nope. Right. Well, yeah, Hello? You hear it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, there is a spectral effect on the suppression of melatonin in the eyes, having to do with blue light. Uh, turns off the melatonin dramatically, and red light does not. So if you do need, for safety reasons, to have night lights on, uh, put some red plastic over them so that you don't see any of the blue. It's just all very much red. So if you wake up in the middle of the night, it doesn't disrupt your melatonin in the middle of the night. You know, that's fascinating because I did research way back when with an Israeli um, uh, chronobiologist where we looked at 440 nanometer blue light, which, as you may know, is used to treat hemoglobinemia in newborns. Mm -hmm. And if a, a, child, a baby is born and it has too much... Um, it has, it's, it has the, the hemoglobin is methylating. The and, fetal uh, hemoglobin. Right. Yeah. Then their liver is not synthesizing vitamin D. And it, it's a serious illness, and we generally can treat it. We treat it by putting these babies under blue light. This is telling you something really important. You cover their eyes because you don't want to damage their eyes. And this, the blood is circulating through the skin, and the blue light alone, over usually two or three days, is enough to bring down this, this problem in their blood. You're actually affecting the synthesis of vitamin D in the liver with light. And the blue light is biologically potentially damaging. We did um, work on whether this could be playing a role for acute lymphocytic leukemia in the children and in some of the illnesses in the nurses who were taking care of these babies because they were experiencing effects. But I didn't realize that blue light interferes with melatonin. That's really and interesting. It's not just that, too, that red light helps um, energize mitochondrial um, electron transport um, complexes. Hmm. It's, uh, it's absorbed. They absorb it and add it to ATP production so that the, if you're doing red light before sleep and red light after sleep, it keeps your mitochondria tuned up so that they don't need the cortisol 
So you're, you're bracketing your cortisol release by having red light before you go to bed and red light when you wake up in the morning so that the, the, the cumulative cortisol stress is, un, is controlled as well. So that's what you get from sunset before sleep and sunrise in the morning to wake right. up. So we, we should actually go to bed when the sun sets yeah. and get up when it rises. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, I don't know who raised their hands first. There's two hands that came up over here. Uh, well, I was just commenting, you had mentioned uh, the sensitivity aspects, and I thought that there was a ADA recognition to uh, EM sensitivity uh, people. Not yet, huh? Well, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about it. There is a recognition of a disability of uh, sensitivity in uh, Sweden. I think that there may be a few other countries that have recognized it. I know that in India, I'm in touch with a group that is working on um, a group of electrical engineers, by the way, that are working on reducing wireless in elementary schools uh, where they had extraordinarily high levels. And let me be clear, there, there are two studies that I know of that are really solid on this. One is done by Andrew Marino, where he did an evocation study on a physician who reported sensitivity, blinded, so she didn't know whether she was getting exposed or not, and was able to show a number of altered parameters I don't remember, I think galvanic skin response, I think heart rate variability, um, and a number of other uh, indicators. But the problem is some people who experience this uh, phenomenon don't have an acute effect. They experience the problem um, a day later or two days later. It's kind of like if you, any of you have food sensitivities or gluten sensitivities or lactose, sometimes you'll experience it within a few hours and sometimes you won't experience it for many hours. And then it's so hard to figure out what is, what's, why does your stomach hurt or what has happened. Because not all reactions are like that. And we used to joke in toxicology that the way we set standards for most toxic substances in the 1960s and 70s was if you didn't drop dead in front of the investigator, it was safe. <laughs> <clears throat> and that for lead, for example, that was a huge problem. Because lead is a neurotoxin very damaging to the central nervous system, especially damaging when exposure takes place before age two, when that brain that I showed you is doubling and growing so rapidly. And a little bit of lead exposure before age two is so much more toxic to the brain than exposure, say, at age 30. It's just not even comparable. So I said Andrew Marino did the one evocation study, and Magda Havas has done another on heart rate variability as well um, <clears throat> that um, shows uh, alterations, but the challenge is that I believe that there are people who react and it's not quick. It's not a quick reaction and there's a variety of things, whether insomnia, migraines, tinnitus is an example. We have tinnitus, which is this ringing in the ears. It's reported to be increasing in younger and younger people, okay? Uh, on early onset of Parkinson's, listen, there's a, so many causes of Parkinson's. I'm not suggesting that cell phones are the cause of Parkinson's. I am not. I know that pesticides and solvents and other neurotoxins are important, but cell phone radiation could be playing a role there. They could be playing a role with the reported earlier onset of atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is one of the most common cardiac anomalies in the country, and it can be very, very uncomfortable. Often people get only one episode, it goes away. But Sometimes it, it can lead to stroke and death, and it's reported to be increasing more in younger people. So we just don't, again, this is my plea, a dollar a phone fee for five years to train people to do the research that needs to be done so that we can answer these questions and design things to be safe as possible. It really shouldn't be that hard. I am optimistic. I did live in Washington for 35 years. It's hard not to do that without being an optimist. Uh, but I'm realistic, and that's why I'm here, and that's why I will come and talk to any of you, the companies for whom you work, about why we all need to work together on this. There are great opportunities for software engineers and hardware reconfiguration, phenomenal opportunities. Who's responsible for that? Is it the FDA or the FCC? Can we do it with the microphone, please? All right. Okay. Uh, Mike? I'll, I'll, my I'll answer. Is more like a uh, safety with the iPhone? 
I'm sorry, say your question, yes? Safety, safety on the iPhone. The iPhone can be used as a speakerphone. Tell them how. Tell them exactly okay. what to do. You go into the settings. Yeah, go to your settings. This is really important, what he's about to tell you. I asked him to tell everybody. And under settings, go to accessibility. And, and where is setting? Is That's one of the main things? One of the main things. It's settings. all the way down toward the end? Because uh, mine is... It's used normally for people to have hard of hearing in a lot of places, you know, there's a lot of other things in there. I don't see accessibility. Is it under general, maybe? Oh, it's under going to general. Yeah, then it's under accessibility. Then accessibility. Got it. Right. I got it. Now, once you're in accessibility, go down to incoming calls and click on the incoming calls, and you will find it the default, and the default is really the headset up against your head. But if you click on the thing that says speaker, Okay. Whenever an incoming call comes in, you've got a speakerphone in your hand. If you're in the car, it's a speakerphone. It comes on automatically as a speakerphone. It doesn't come on for the headset. So you can hold it away from the body when you're using it. And if, it, if you're in a place where there's a lot of people, you will also have a place where you can uh, sure. shut off the speaker and put it up to your head. Well, now, let me just add one thing about being in a car, though. Oh. If you're in a car, <laughs> yeah. then not only is the safety issue is a real thing, and it's a big deal. It, okay, but if you're in a moving anything, even skiing or rollerblading or biking, and you're moving through space, as you move through space, the phone naturally goes from one cell antenna to another, okay? And each time it goes from one zone to another, it goes to max power, so you don't drop the call. So you never want to have the phone close to you. And when you're in a car, you either use the car roof as the antenna, which is how the new cars are all designed, and that's a good idea. Or you go to Radio Shack or something, and you buy one of these converters that plugs into this, what used to be a cigarette lighter so that you run it through the car antenna. Otherwise, when you're in a car, your head's the antenna, which is not a good idea. Well, as Lloyd said, a Bluetooth, you know, the, the Bluetooth is, the, the question is, how about using a Bluetooth when you're in your car? You're still going to get the phone working with more radiation going out, and it depends on where you keep the phone. If the phone is a couple inches away, I don't, I'm really not too concerned. But if you have that Bluetooth on 16 hours a day, it's not a good idea. People, I think people used to do that as a fashion statement. I think that's kind of gone out of style, hasn't it? You know, I, I haven't noticed that too much. Okay, hold on. Uh, just a couple of points. Uh, at FMBR, we'd, we'd love to be able to work with you with regard to uh, some research projects and also to get the word out with regard to cell phones and uh, right. EMFs. Uh, and the second point uh, has to do with another form of l trying to help out in terms of, uh, of the EMFs, and that's with a concept called biogeometry. I don't know if you're familiar with that whole, whole area or not, but uh, biogeometry has devices uh, that in, uh, this is the guy from Egypt, uh, Ibrahim Karim, and I don't know if you know about that, but he, in the city of Hamburg in Switzerland, the whole city, was complaining and getting sick from the all from the cell tower. Swisscom had put the cell tower at the very top of the city, which was uh, basically on top of the church, uh, and people were getting sick, irritable, etc., 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 and it was pretty widespread because they weren't used to any of this stuff. And uh, he came up with some devices that was able to remedy the whole city, which is very, very amazing, and so. The concepts of biogeometry, it's not enough time to talk about the, the concepts. I, I definitely here. want to follow up with you. I uh, have to say, someone else asked me this. Yeah. Those chips that Suzanne Summers puts on the phone and that people buy and spend hundreds of dollars on thinking they're protecting themselves, they really, there is, I've never seen any data on any of these chips or devices to suggest that they work. Now, that's not to say that there may not be some technologies, and maybe you, what you're talking about is, is one no. of them. It does, it's, but if it's a chip on a phone? It's not a chip on good. the phone, good. and it uh, has to do with uh, energies and the interferences of the energies. Uh, and, uh, 
Well, the Bose headset works with noise cancellation technology, and there are some cancellation technologies that might make might make yeah. sense. It might. It's probably best for me to get you the study itself and have you take a look at that. I'd be glad to. And then that way you can uh, understand that aspect of Lloyd, it. Lloyd, have you heard of this? Well, I'd like, you know. The do you whole country of Switzerland was negotiating with him to do it for the whole country, but I don't think the negotiations went through. OK, um, look, um, the, the hour is late. We're all um, here because we really care about this issue. And I don't mean any disrespect to anybody, but there's an awful lot of smoke and mirrors running around on this issue. And there's a lot of people who've made a lot of money on public fears, right? So I want to learn more. I'm open-minded, but I'm very skeptical. And that's, if you're really a, a good scientist, you have to be, you know? I say, <clears throat> I trust in God, and all others have to provide data. <laughs> OK, good. All right, well, that, you know, that, that, that helps. But, but you understand my point, that, that there's just, and, and there's a lot of money that's made uh, on people's fears, you know? And I don't, you know, we have to be responsible, um, and, that, and it's hard, and it really, it really is hard. As just as an example, I have been asked by so many companies to endorse products, like this one or that one, and I'll use them, but I really don't think that that would be a good thing for me to do, because the whole point of what I'm trying to do now is exactly what this Einstein quote says. And I would love to work with any company here, um, but I don't take any money, in order to make things work better. That's what I want to do, right? And if this, if this thing you're talking about has merit to it, I'm, I want to learn more about it. I'm, ha I'm happy to learn more. I've got one comment. Cordless phones also are a risk, and most people might not be aware of that. That was actually, yes, that's a good point. In the Hardell data. Um, yeah. Uh, well, it, it, it's a little, co yes, Lloyd, almost, I would say not equal in the sense that, um, sorry, I'm not going to find it too easy, in the sense that there was a longer term use, um, but um, not per call made. Do you know what I mean? It was like, the, the point is, Susan's correct. Cordless phones in your home is a mini base station, all right? So if you have a cordless phone, don't sleep with it next to the head of your bed. Very important. And <clears throat> Swisscom and uh, what's that other Swiss company? Uh, Siemens. Siemens makes a really good cordless phone that I bought for my pregnant daughter that is an eco decked phone. It only emits radiation when you use it. It doesn't emit 24-7. But American cordless phones emit radiation 24-7, and they have this incredible thing now. You can get a cordless phone with a range of a half a mile with, I think, what, six to seven watts? It's unbelievable. They're, you know, so, and this was, I'm not making this up. There's a baby monitor that you can listen to your baby cry a half a mile away. I mean, come on. If you have to be a half a mile away from your baby when they're asleep, and you need a baby monitor, you're going to, and a, you know, getting a half a mile, if there was ever really a problem. I mean, we've really got to stop and think about this technology and understand how to use it in a more intelligent and reasonable way. So we need to be aware of these issues. The internet of everything. We're about to have, to, to realize the internet of everything. John, put it in front John Chambers says it's a $14 trillion opportunity, and you know they want a part of that. Some of those things are going to be cows. Every cow will be, have an internet connection. Why? So that the farmer can check the vital signs. It'll have GPS on it, so he'll know if the, if the cow was taken away or stolen, etc. Every cow, every sheep, every goat, most pet dogs and cats will have internet connections. How are you going <laughs> to tell all those guys how to take precautions? Well, first of all, I'm not going to tell them anything. I'm going to find out what they're thinking and learn more about 
look, there might be some circumstances under which putting a chip in an animal makes some sense, right? There might be. Uh, but I share your concern about the prospect of this. I wonder what it would be doing to the quality of the milk of the dairy cows. I mean, I don't think we know, right? And um, there, but there could be an advantage if you're trying to track uh, un unusual, almost extinct migrating animals, unless you're having an effect to make them more extinct. <laughs> no, I mean, really, that's, that's a question. I've asked, uh, just an example, I'm writing a new book now, and um, in that book I'm studying something called the cryptochrome. Anybody know what that is? I didn't know either. It's, it's in, in the uh, brain, there are um, proteins that allow migrating mammals and birds to sense the Earth's electromagnetic field. They're called cryptochromes. And the research on this has been done by putting blinders on rock doves, which are the homing pigeons and the animals that always find their way home. And if, it used to be thought that they were seeing things. That's how they could find their way. You know, they migrate you know, hundreds or sometimes thousands of miles. Well, they now they put blinders on these things, and they still can find their way home. So the question is how? And the answer is they identified in the brain these um, um, iron-based proteins that can sense the Earth's geomagnetic field and allow these animals to migrate. So I'm looking at the wolves of Yellowstone. And uh, they track their, their range by putting chips in them. And I said, how do you know that you're not affecting the wolves? And the answer is they don't. I mean, these are research questions. We need to answer them. But the internet of everything in that particular thing you just mentioned, I mean, I know there are also people who want to put it in children or soldiers and or, you know, and I think we, we really need to have a, an intense national conversation informed by well done science and we don't have that now. We do not have that now. Despite all these reports and commissions, some of which I participated in for Clinton and some of which are continuing on, we simply don't have not made that investment. In this pamphlet that, that I hope you all have, there's a picture produced by Nora Volkoff, who is the, now the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. It's the picture here of the uh, levels of glu glucose in the brain, right? She published this study in JAMA uh, in uh, 2011. And what she did is she took healthy human male volunteers. She developed PET scanning of the brain. That's what she does. She's a brilliant woman, MD, PhD. And these men were blind. They did not know whether the phone on their head was on or off. They didn't know. And she studied glucose metabolism and showed that when the phone was on, the amount of glucose in the brain was significantly elevated. Now, Alzheimer's has been called diabetes of the brain because it means there's too much sugar on the brain, too much glucose on the brain. We don't know what this means, but she showed that 50 minutes of glucose on the brain, and I didn't show you those studies because I have, un, you know, I do have hundreds of studies I could show you, not thousands, but hundreds. She showed that 50 minutes produced a significant elevation of glucose in the brain in healthy males. I had dinner with her a month ago. She can't get funding to extend that research. That's the solution to the problem. <laughs> That's why I need your help, all right? That's ridiculous. This is a very important finding, and it has profound importance for exactly this. We're going to start putting chips in biological creatures. Um, what about using a stylus? Because what some people have noticed is when they, you know, our hands, our fingers are on it, it's almost like every cell. It's so different if we use a stylus on the mm -hmm. cell phone. We're not touching the pad. And I have some sensitive clients where the difference was dramatic. When they put their hands on it, they were literally ill with, with heart. They got a lot of heart extra beats or you know a lot of irregular heartbeat. And there's studies for the heart that shows that it's profoundly when their hands were on the pad. But when they used the stylus, they were not feeling that same physiological, you know, dramatic response. I wanted to know your comments um, if a stylus makes a difference or if it's just their imagination. There are anecdotal that. reports 
there are anecdotal reports that for some people it can make a difference. We won't be able to evaluate that until we have more rigorous um, funding and science in place to do that. In the meantime, I think people have to do what seems to work for them. I believe that we all have biological responses to this, and some people perceive it, a small percentage, and most of us don't. But I think there are growing numbers of people who do think that, for example, whether it's the old brick phone that would be, you know, really, really hot, or whether it was the phantom ring, you know, that people would get back. I mean, when I started out writing this book, Disconnect, I had three cell phones. I wore them like a gunslinger, you know? <laughs> and I was one of these people I wanted, I had a staff of like 60, and I wanted my staff to be able to respond at all times of day or night, which is pretty obnoxious if you think about it. No offense to anybody here, but I do think people are entitled to their private time. And I, and I started to, to wonder, I was fine, and this woman who worked for me, she was like, what do you want? You want me to wear this device? I said, yes, I do. I want to, you know, we've got it. This is really important. We're at a cancer institute. I was the founding director of the Center for Environmental Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. And there was a sense of emergency and self-importance that comes along with having these devices. Perhaps you're familiar with the syndrome. <laughs> and I realized in retrospect that it, it was kind of exciting you know, and I, it's, a, it's a great uh, toy. It's great to be able to find out, you know, when was Constantinople conquered by Alexander the Great. If, if you decide you need to know that at 1130 at night, you know, now you have a way to do it. But I think, like with all of these things, we've got to ask about the Internet of Everything and what, what, what we need to do to use this in a more intelligent way. So we... We have to be out of here by 10 o'clock. Oh my gosh. So it, it takes a little bit of time for us to kind of wrap things up. So we want to have like one or two more questions. And here's what I would and say. We already have two uh, people I have for a that, Facebook so. page. I'm not into the social media stuff. And if there's anybody there who would like to help me learn how to really be smart about it, I'm eager to learn. But I have a Facebook page for Environmental Health Trust. We have a website. I've got a Twitter handle at Deborah Lee Davis. We've got at Environ Health Trust. Write to me um, with any questions you have. Send them to the Smart Life Forum. I'll answer anything you want you know, in, in writing. This is a group that I'm really thrilled to talk to. I really am. You, you guys have a lot of collective knowledge and experience with, with the world that I know very little about. I'm not a business person. I'm not a tech person, per se. But I know that I can work with some of you to see that this is going to be a better world. And I really want to do that. And so I'm, and I'm open to advice, and we, I don't have any vested interest, including in our website, which I think is not too great. So please, if you want to ask me questions or come up with suggestions for what we need to do, I'm quite open. And I also have a daughter that lives in Sebastopol, so it's not that hard for me to come back to this area as well. Okay? <laughs> We're going to have two more questions, try and keep the answers quick, and then we'll hold. I'd like to know uh, what, how, you feel, how you feel about the electric uh, cars, especially when you're in there with a cell phone. Yeah. I'll let, is there anyone else here who wants to comment who knows maybe they've measured fields in the cars? Is there anyone here who's measured them? Let's, let's hear from him. Go ahead. Honda Insight, and everything was fine up in this area. Everything was fine in front of you, but down by the driver's acceleration foot, it went off the scale. Over 130, uh, what's it, gaps. 130. So it was down, and the reason for that is the battery was in the back of the car, but the motor was located just about in front of your foot. And I'm sure that most of the electric cars, the electric motor is probably in the general same area. What about the Tesla? Don't know. Does anybody know? <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I, I really, I they, just. Uh, they, they learned with the Prius. The yeah. Microphone. yeah. They, they've been going through an evolutionary process with electric cars, starting with the 
unintended acceleration of the Prius that was apparently caused from EM pulses. So nowadays, pretty much everything, including Tesla, is covered with carbon fiber and uh, shielding. So they've just tried to, now they're over shielding everything to so try to prevent that. So the graphene, which is, is yeah. basically, that's yeah. what graphene is. Graphene is a nanomaterial that's carbon-based, and carbon basically does protect, right? Yep. So, you know, it's not like it's good or bad. It's, it, again, it's an, it's an evolution. I was talking about the first release of the Insight. Okay. So I, and I wrote Honda at the time that they needed to shield that particular part by the acceleration and accelerator. They, they I never got a response back. Well, they heard you, though, because I think that whole industry, as, as Jim has said, that whole industry, they understand. I mean, I think, in principle, electric cars are great. OK, last question, comment. So Deborah, you know you missed out on the January 28th Commonwealth Club, San Francisco, the Smart Grid, Smart Meter. If anybody's interested, go to the commonwealthclub.org and under past events and pull up January 28th. And uh, hopefully they've posted the audio and or video for that session. Anyway, the question has come out of that. Uh, I'm very concerned. The discussion was that at some point, because the levels of overall RFR radio frequency radiation have increased something like 10,000 percent, you know, over 20 years, and we have no natural defenses, that some of this stuff is cumulative. In other words, just because, you know, you, you put your cell phone five feet away or you need the Wi-Fi, your body starts, can only handle so much exposure over time. At what point is the tipping point for the human body be before you become permanently ES? And then all of a sudden, you know, all hell breaks out. I mean, you, you just you can't be anywhere near these fields, and you're well, totally screwed. I, I think I go back to what I said in the beginning. Distance is your friend. There are almost no devices that we use directly next to the brain or body except for these phones, which are not really phones. They're mini computers. Having said that, though, I am very concerned, and the Environmental Health Trust is, is consolidating information from around the world about the growing use of Wi-Fi in classrooms where you have little kids sitting around with devices that are all connected to Wi-Fi in a circle with their uh, close proximity to one another with these devices that were tested to be used 20 centimeters from an adult male body. So um, I do think, however, <coughs> The problem of, of towers and all these other devices is that the amount of exposure you get per unit, per device, is greatest from the phone, hands down, or a laptop that is actually on your lap, which it's not supposed to be. So you're right that we are growing up in a sea of radio frequency that did not exist before. That's why we need research. That's why we need training. And that's why we need to be smarter about how we're using these things now. Right? Deborah, thank you so much. Yes, good, good applause for Deborah. Thank you for joining us. It's been fantastic. Thank you.